Today, my guest is Gene Trowbridge. He is a commercial real estate broker, CCIM, a syndicator, an author. He wrote the book, It's a Whole New Business. He's a speaker, a real estate attorney, and a founding partner at uh, the corporate securities law firm, Trowbridge Sedoti LLP, and uh, an expert in real estate syndication. And in just a minute, we're going to speak with Gene about uh, syndication law and the issues with regulation uh, D and uh, private placement. But first, a quick reminder, if you like the show, CREPN Radio, please let us know. You can like, share, and subscribe. And as always, you can leave a comment. We'd love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you'd like to see how handsome our guests are, be sure to check out our YouTube channel, and that's Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Gene. Welcome to CREPN Radio. Thanks, Darren. I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm I'm so glad you were able to join us today. And uh, before we uh, jump into our conversation, if you could take just a minute and share with the listeners a little bit about your background. All right. Well, I really had three uh, three careers. And it, that's amazing given I'm only 27, but I've had uh, three careers. I had a career as a commercial real estate broker. I had a career as a real estate syndicator where I put together uh, uh, syndications concentrating primarily in building self-storage facilities here in Southern California. And then when I was 45, I went to law school and my third career now is uh, being an attorney and my practice is really specialized in commercial real estate uh, securities. Uh, and that would be uh, my third uh, career. And uh, I'm still working on my fourth one. I'm going to keep that a secret. Oh, yeah? Got a surprise? Is it, you gonna, is it something real estate related? You know, I don't even know. Oh. So it's a secret to me. But, <laughs> you know, idea. it's it's a... Uh, it's, it's, it's a uh, it's a shame if you don't try new things once in a while. No, I love it. It's the uh, seeker, constantly seeking. It's good stuff. Uh, Gene, I'm just curious, based on your uh, experience and uh, um, you know, having been a, a broker and also a, a syndicator and now uh, being a part of a law firm that specializes in syndications, have you kept count? Do you have any sense of how many syndications you've you've been a part of in one way or another? Um, totally no. But uh, since 2014, since the, uh, uh, the formation of uh, this law firm, we do keep track of that. And we have about, oh, 550 clients, individual clients. We have almost 900 offerings. And we're over the $4 billion mark in uh, dollars raised in our offerings. Not the value of the real estate, but the dollars raised. So for a, a boutique firm, right now we have five attorneys. Uh, that's a pretty strong, pretty strong record. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it doesn't sound like you're just trying to figure it out. Uh, <laughs> you've kind of worked out some of the kinks, I suppose, huh? Yeah, that's right. So... For the uninitiated, uh, could you define for us what syndication is? Sure. Uh, and that's a very good question because that's one of the most common questions I get. Someone calls me in the off on the phone and says, Gene, I want to put four or five people together. We want to buy a piece of real estate, but we don't want it to be a syndication. Well, that's the wrong question. A syndication is any time... Uh, two or more people combine their money and their expertise to do something. Some of the examples of syndication that you see are when you go to the movies, at the beginning of the movie, it probably talks about three or four different companies who have com come together to make the movie. I, uh, I talk about uh, insurance, uh, long-term health care insurance for an old guy like me. That's really a syndication. We all pool our small amounts of money, and then uh, the big pile of money will take care of us, hopefully. Uh, other syndications are when you fly an airplane, 
you don't have a plane, you don't have the management expertise, you 140 of your best friends climb into the, what I call the flying Petri dish and, <laughs> and fly somewhere, that's a syndication. So simply, a syndication is when you and other investors get together to buy some real estate. Now, that's not a legal entity, that's not an anything, it's just a definition. The real question is, is it a security? That's the issue, because when people say, I don't want to do a syndication, they're asking the wrong question, they're using the wrong language, they're saying, I want to put these people together and buy something, but I don't want it to be a security. Because with the security, you, were, you walk into a whole different world, and you know that's the title of my book, it's a whole new business. The securities world is totally different than the real estate world. Okay. It's different. So that's, that's my long winded answer to that question, Darren. No, it's a, it's a perfect uh, <clears throat> starting point, uh, I think for today. Um, and, and you mentioned that it's, it's not an entity, but it's more of a kind of a, a coming together and, and actually it's a security. Is that kind of the distinction as opposed well, to? Well, it's a syndication. And the question is, is someone going to manage the money for the other people? Are there going to be passive investors? And in there, is there going to be an active investor? So the government has an interest in protecting these passive investors. So the government long time ago set rules that apply to uh, the syndicator who's going to take the money from the passives and run it. I mean, the definition of a security, Darren, is if there's an investment of money in a, in a common enterprise, the investors expect a profit, but someone else is doing the work. So you've got passive investors and you've got the syndicator. And there's a reason for the government to regulate what the syndicator does to protect the passive investors. So you can have a, you can have a, a group who come together in a syndication, three or four people, and go out and buy something and they all decide that they will all be active managers and that they uh, will all uh, vote uh, unanimously on the big decisions. And I'd call that a member managed something or other, probably an LLC. And if it's just member managed, then one of the four parts of the definition falls apart. The fourth prong is uh, managed by someone else. Well, it's not managed by someone else. It's managed by them. So there's no one in charge of the passives money. In fact, there are no passives. All the investors are active. So that's not a security, and we don't need to regulate that. But the minute they put uh, Darren Gross in charge of the money, it's a security, right? Gotcha. I appreciate you making the distinction, because I think sometimes people uh, – you know, speak of more like a joint venture or some sort of little partnership where there's, yeah, right. um, you know, the, the, everybody's active, like you said, uh, and, and just that distinction there seems pretty straightforward. Well, that's the hot top, one of the hot topics today. And I've, I've heard some, you know, I troll a lot of podcasts and I listen to a lot of other people's podcasts and I always hear this, well, gee, you can do a joint venture and you don't need to make it a syndication. Well, once again, that's the wrong use of the word. A joint venture would be two people or three people or a number of people getting together to do something. Well, that in itself is a syndication. But a joint venture isn't a legal entity. It's just an explanation of how people are coming together. You drive downtown and you see a big hole in the ground downtown and you see a fence all around it and you see First National Bank is providing the construction financing, some big company is, is funding the permanent financing, and ABC contracting company is doing the building. The contracting company has the bulldozers, the permanent financing has the permanent financing, and First National Bank has the construction lending expertise. And they call it a joint venture. Well, that's not how it's owned. It's probably owned in a general partnership. There's no entity. There's nothing in a joint venture that takes title. That's just a description of how the people who take title are coming together to do 
the work. And if it's a true joint venture, everyone is making, um, all the decisions are made unanimously. Okay, you could say it's a joint venture, but if it's actually an LLC with 10 people and a managing member, it's a security. So, I mean, it, it becomes, I think at some point, uh, just physically impossible for the, like you said, everybody coming to the same decision and stuff as a matter of just efficiency and moving forward. Uh, just as a matter, if you, if you have more than X number of people, I would think that, you know, syndication would be the natural way just based on just efficiency. Is that not? Well, that's right. One, the last podcast I heard the first question that was presented to the attorney like me who was speaking is how many people does it take before you have a syndication? Well, wrong question. The answer is two. That wasn't the answer that was given, but that's the answer, it's two. And then the question is, well, how many people would it take before it becomes a security? And, and you hit it, run and hit. I don't know, how, you make a, how will you make a decision? How many people is too many to have unanimous votes on decisions? And the minute one person takes control, let's say we put together an LLC and the members can vote on all the day-to-day -day stuff and it's all unanimous voting, but Gene Trowbridge can make a decision when you sell the property or Gene Trowbridge can make a decision when you refinance the property. You've got yourself a security. Got it. Now that, that, uh, the decision uh, making and, and like you said, the uh, somebody else's uh, trusting or I, I'm placing my money with you and I'm trusting and I have an expectation of some sort of um, um, economic gain. Uh, well, yes, in the world, in the, the law in securities without getting too deep is it is that if Gene Trowbridge is a sponsor, Gene Trowbridge has to give all the investors all the material information they need to make an informed decision before they vote. And that's a securities law issue, full disclosure. And so that's to protect the investors, right? Then there are other rules in the securities, which you know, maybe we go into or maybe not, how much money can be raised, how many investors can there be? And all those are ways that the federal government is uh, regulating risk. You know, if we say that there can only be uh, so many uh, uh, people in a deal, well, that's their attempt to regulate risk, right? If we say there can be as many people in the deal as you want, they're probably gonna come back and say, well, that's gonna be people who, can, who are smart and who are rich, who can make their own decision and maybe we don't need to protect them, okay? Yeah, right. So just for uh, clarity here, that so you stated that the, the syndication is not an entity itself, is that correct? No, because a, a syndication could be, it could be today almost everything is a limited liability company. Mm -hmm. It could be a limited partnership. It could be a corporation, you know, uh, Google, uh, everything on the New York Stock Exchange is, is a syndication. Um, Tesla is a syndication. Tesla with their $1,000 a share stock, can you believe it, is, is a syndication. Uh, the legal entity isn't the issue. The issue is, is the investor investing money expecting to make a profit and someone else is running it? Got it. And, and again, just is the, the syndication is a, the, you know, what it represents, is it, is it more of like a definition of how the entity is operating? or is It's really it a definition that two or more people are combining their management expertise and their money. Okay. That's what it is. And then the question is, what entity, if there's going to be an entity, and you could have a, you could have a syndication with two individuals taking title individually, tenant in common. Okay. You're going to buy 50% with your money and I'm going to buy 50% with my money. We're tenants in common as individuals. We own the property. That's the ownership entity, tenant in common. That's a syndication. And more than likely, that's not a security with just two of us, but if five of us do it, somewhere along the line, someone's going to start making decisions and right. that's going to raise it to us in uh, security. Right. Um, I, I know there's different versions of uh, syndications um, 
and I believe is this all under the um, regulation D is that where the syndication law well, regulation D that's an important I'm glad you brought that up when uh, they wrote the syndication rules and the syndication rules we work under now really come from 1933 and 1934 and have changed but over time the uh, syndication and the securities laws have uh, matured to where there's really a dichotomy. Does the syndication law need to be applied to protect those people who are rich and smart? Does it need to be applied to protect people who aren't rich and smart? And the answer keeps coming down to we don't need laws to protect the rich and smart people for the most part, but we do need laws to protect those who aren't rich and smart. And in 1981, Regulation D that had been around for a long time was really modified and codified to say that um, in a private placement, you can have as many rich and smart people as you want. And then they applied the accredited investor definition to rich and smart. But you can only have 35 non-rich and smart people, call them sophisticated, and that's to limit the risk. How many people can lose their money in this deal? How many people who aren't rich and smart? 35, and you can't advertise. So 1981, that was the big, uh, the big rule. And I said this dichotomy keeps going uh, the Jobs Act that came out in 2012, 2013, really said, okay, there's a lot of rich and smart people who will never know about Gene Trowbridge's offerings because Gene doesn't know them. Right? Why not? Why shouldn't they know about Gene's offerings? And there are a lot of rich and smart people that Gene doesn't know. Well, why not? So let's let Gene advertise to all the rich and smart people there are, and let's let all the rich and smart people find out about Gene's offerings. And why would you do that? To promote capital formation. And so they came out with 506C, which simply was, hey, the rich and smart people all along haven't needed our protection. We're going to expand it and we're gonna let Gene build a database of rich and smart people that he might not know and try to sell them his offerings. And then rich and smart people can go online when they come home at night and have a glass of, of port and smoke a cigar and search the web for offerings offered by people like Gene and see if there's something they want to invest in. So that's been the trend is moving away from protection for the rich and smart people, but beefing up the protection from the, for those who aren't. Got it. So in, in going back to uh, essentially 81, uh, kind of the, the rules there, um, was that when the, the relationship was critical to this in, in order to, be, to participate, you, there had to be a relationship or does that um, that still is that still is the case, and and I'm going to I'm going to explain it like this. If the SEC came to you and said, you know, you were advertising, weren't you? You were advertising. You were soliciting uh, when you took those people in, and 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 that's a problem because if you're going to do that, you can only have accredited investors, and you have to have some third party verification. Okay. Um, you're advertising. And you say, no, I'm not advertising. This is family and friends and blah, 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 blah. Your defense against advertising is number one, you had a pre-existing relationship with the investor. And number two, simultaneously, you had a substantive relationship with that investor. Those words go together, pre-existing and substantive. So in order to defend yourself against a claim of advertising, you have to be able to show that all your investors had a relationship with you before your offering came out. 
my firm, the date is when you sign the fee agreement with me to do your offering. I think, I think up to that point, you really don't know what you're doing. You might have a letter of intent. You're just negotiating. You might even have a purchase and sale agreement. You might be wholesaling. You might be buying it yourself. I don't know. But when you hire me to do your offering documents, I think it's pretty clear cut you're looking to do an offering. And at that time, if you would, your database kind of freezes. Everyone who's in your database up to that time would be pre-existing. Now the question is, are they pre-existing and substantive, or did you just download some some list of people list. your data? Yeah. Is, you know, I love that. Now that's okay if they're all accredited. If they're all accredited and you go do an advertising, a 506C, you can sell to people you don't know. You don't need a pre-existing relationship. You don't need a substantive relationship. All you need to do is have some third-party verification that the people you're taking are, are accredited. accredited. Yeah. So substantive, uh, is there any kind of a timeline or a knowledge base or is there a measure for defining that? No. <laughs> Oh. You'd think you'd think it wouldn't be nice if we had four bullet points, but but we don't. And over the years, there have been things called no action letters that the SEC issues when people want to uh, define substantive, and uh, they've never really done it. The broad definition is you, as the syndicator, know enough about the investor to know if the risk in the offering is something that they can uh, handle and uh, through their education and their advisors, they can make a determination for themselves that it's okay. And at the same time, the investor knows enough about you to uh, want to know about your offerings and hear about it and go ahead and invest. That's, that's about it. There's no bright line on that. I'm sure if I looked it up, I could read you the definition. I don't have it right here, but that's, that's my uh, plain English definition. Gotcha. Um, so basically, we're, we've got a, a coming together of of uh, like-minded, known people or accredited uh, people uh, looking for um, to to profit from sure. the investment. Um, it, it, as far as the 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 benefits, I guess, of syndication is it is it basically a, a means of raising capital so we can all do something greater than we could uh, on our own? Is that? Well, if, if you think about the examples of syndication I gave at, gave at the beginning, if just one person was going to make the movie, or if you had a single passenger. I've seen those airplane, home movies, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, it really doesn't work. But I think the reason, uh, Darren, is that... Um, the investor public as a whole, for the most part, doesn't have enough money to buy a piece of real estate themselves, doesn't have the education and the training to um, understand a real estate investment by themselves, doesn't have the time and energy to do the management. And uh, if we put a syndication together, we uh, provide all those things for an investor, combine their their money, uh, provide them professional management and, uh, and professional property management, things that they couldn't do. Uh, so that's why, that's what you're looking for in a syndication if you're going to be a syndication investor. Um, a lot of people who say, my broker friends, my real estate commercial broker friends say, well, I've had a lot of clients over the years and they bought a lot of properties. I think I'm going to do some syndication. And a lot of that fails because the people who have the money and the time and the energy will continue to stick with their own property. But how many people is that? You know, there's, there's huge. I, I, think, I think I saw somewhere along the line that there are 38 or 40,000 accredited investor households in the United States. And a lot of them don't want to buy real estate, but they love to invest in yours because their friends own real estate and their friends have made a lot of money in real estate. So they probably know you 
there's all sorts of people, Darren, that you know, who you've never asked to invest with you, who would love to invest with you. You just never asked them. Right. <laughs> my, my best story is uh, uh, Dan, the dry cleaner man. <laughs> and for years I went in to see uh, to Dan and, he, and today he still does my dry cleaning. My girls had their first jobs with him. It was just amazing. And here I am, a big money raiser, big syndicator. And one day he asked me what I did. Shame on me. And I told him that I was putting together syndications to buy, uh, self, to build self storage in Southern California. And he said, Well, is that something I can invest in? Okay, so my job as a syndicator is to build my database of investors. And he asks me, Okay. Right. I said, Sure, you can. So he, he threw $300,000 at a deal. He did that 10 times. It's a pretty good dry cleaning business. Pretty good dry cleaning business, yeah. but because I didn't know that he inherited 36 dry cleaning companies when his dad died. And the only reason I knew him is the one that was close to my house was close to his house. And that's where he came every day. But uh -huh. I never asked. Okay. And so here's someone who was too busy to buy real estate, had some money, didn't know who to trust, didn't know what to do. And that's what the syndicator's job is go out and farm those people and give them the opportunity. You don't sell a syndication to someone. You give someone the opportunity to invest with you. No, I, I appreciate you, uh, you know, making the distinction of what the job is, is, you know, finding the, the uh, potential investors there. In fact, I wonder if you could take a minute and just define who the members of the syndication are, the, the, the person that's leading the, or the, call them the sponsor, or the general partner, or how do you, how do you define them? If it's an LLC, we have members. Members invest their money in the LLC that buys the property is the borrower but someone needs to run that LLC. So we have a managing member. In my world, the managing member is also an LLC made up of more than one person. So we have continuity. Because we need to make sure that, you know, if there's 34, 30 or 40 investors in the deal, we need to make sure that the member, the managing member is always there. Um, a single member LLC upon the death of, a, of that member dissolves. Now, who's going to run? Who's going to run all this? What's a bank going to say? We recently in the company had a situation where a fellow was 56 years old, and he came to us and he wanted to do a big uh, mobile home park development in Louisiana. And I said, well, you got to find, you got to find a second person. So uh, someone in his office who was in his late 20s, became a 10% owner in the manager LLC. Two years later, the 56 year old guy's dead. Who would have thought? Got pneumonia and died in four weeks. Oh, wow. What do you do? Well, luckily we've got the 10% owner who just picks up and goes right to work. We don't have to go out to the investors and figure out which one of you want to run this and all that. We just, we just carry on. So the lender is in, interested in continuity. Your investors are interested in continuity. No, that continuity is definitely uh, uh, what keeps it going, right? Well, really, I think that, uh, that an investor should ask these four questions of a syndicator and then the syndicator should have an answer. <laughs> so this, these questions go out to everyone. The first, the first question is, Darren, if I invest with you, what happens if something happens to you? Man, Darren, if you can't answer that question, you're not gonna get my money, period, okay? So there's the continuity. So we can solve that. The second question an investor should ask is, Darren, um, have you done this before? And I will tell you, Darren, that every single one of us has had to say no to that question the first time. So you gotta go out and get your first deal done. And hopefully you've had some real estate experience 
that uh, is maybe different than syndication. No, I haven't done a syndication, but I've owned five properties myself and I'm a CCIM and I've got an MBA and construction management or whatever it is. You know, you have to overcome that question or they're not gonna give you the, their money. The third question an investor should ask is, if this deal is so good, Darren, are you gonna invest any money in it? The old skin in the game question, Darren. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, yeah, that's where all the money's made is from the investors. So you should have some money. Um, a lot of the deals we're doing today, the minimum investment is 50 or a hundred thousand dollars. And I don't suggest that the sponsor, the syndicator invest 50 or a hundred in every deal because pretty soon you run out of money. I think that you should invest something. And it's core of a, kind of a marketing issue is how much is enough. If it's a hundred thousand minimum and you can put in 40, does that satisfy the investors? I don't know. You'll have to ask the investors. So that's the third question. And then the fourth question is, comes from the investor and the investor says, well, Darren, what happens if something happens to me? Is this liquid? What's the plan? How do I get my money out of it? And that answer is, well, we have a, a well-developed, drafted operating agreement that gives you the rules and I'd be glad to have you look at it. And uh, we take care of all the uh, different ways that can happen and I think you'll be satisfied. I appreciate you sharing those. I was going to ask you if, if we didn't uh, cover it uh, before the end, there are just kind of some questions that should be asked uh, when somebody's considering getting into a syndication. And those all uh, definitely seem like some primary uh, points of concern and yeah, the answer should be available. Or no. Yeah, and I ask, I ask my clients those questions. If a first time client calls me, says they want to do a deal, they want to do a syndication, I'm going to ask them those questions. If I were an investor and I had these four questions, how would you answer them? But the best thing I do is when the passive investor who's invested in, and literally that happens, 25, 30 other deals that other people have run, making a lot of money. They come to me and say, Gene, I want to be a syndicator. My best question is, why? Why would you want to do that? Being a passive investor is working for you. Why would you want to take on the issue of, uh, of being a syndicator? And we have to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk there. And somewhere, we'll probably talk about risk, right? And uh, uh, we, need to, we need to talk about that because this is not a risk-free, nothing-down uh, job. Right. This is a tough job. Okay. Um. I want to ask you a little bit about uh, on the general partner side um, and raising money because uh, I, I think, and I think one of the things I saw on one of your um, uh, online, uh, there was a video, I think I saw you uh, put together a while back and it was, it was speaking about this notion of the general partner and raising money and who can be on the general partnership and, and, and that can you speak a little bit to that as far sure. as sure let's um let's use the analogy to start with of <clears throat> for sale by owner okay from the real estate world the real okay. estate world has licensing of people you can sell your own property without a real estate license but you can't sell mine unless you have a real estate license bring that analogy right over to the securities world where there's a licensing uh, format. You can sell your own security, but you can't sell mine. I can sell the securities I issue, but I can't sell yours. And it's called the issuer exemption. It's not the for sale by owner exemption in the securities world. If you're the issuer, you can sell the securities. So where do the issuers sit? They sit inside the managing member LLC. Members of the managing member LLC are issuers and they can sell the securities you're offering. Anyone outside of that group 
would need a, a securities license to sell those securities. And one of the things we see in the world today is syndicators and uh, uh, people are on the podium uh, talking to big groups of people uh, violate that rule all the time by saying, well, anyone in the audience who wants to put together a group of investors and come in and invest in my deal, and I'll pay you a commission, that's just totally illegal. Because the SEC would say, well, if you're selling someone else's security, you better have a securities license. You don't. You're an unregistered securities broker, and there's huge penalties for that. So you don't want to, you don't want to do that. One last thing about this, Darren, is inside the managing member group, even though you're issuers and even though you can sell the securities, you cannot get paid a commission. In order to collect a commission, you have to have a securities license. You don't have to have a securities license to be an issuer and sell your own stock your own shares, your own interests, but you can't have anyone in there paid a commission. There are a lot of ways we can compensate them. We can share all sorts of fees and everything, but it can't be tied to, well, you raise $500,000, therefore you get X. Can't do that. Gotcha. gotcha. That's news to a lot of people who are going to be listening to this. No, I, I, and I swear that, you know, I, I, uh, I hear kind of what you hinted at some of the, uh, the notions of, you know, yeah, raise some money for me. You, you should do it, you know, kind right. of thing. and, um, uh, when you get into the details though, I don't know, and I haven't pressed on it, but I know I've been, I've been asked a number of times, yeah, you should raise, you should raise some money for us. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, you know, it, it, sometimes it seems kind of fast and loose. Uh, and, um, you know, I'll tell you of, how you can do it. Put together your own offering of investors. Bring them together in your own LLC. Have your own operating agreement. It's your own securities offering. And then that LLC goes into um, Gene Trowbridge's LLC as an investor. That works. You're your own issuer. Okay? You can bring your own people together and let's say it's Darren Gross Fund One. After you've raised that money, you can come in and invest in Trowbridge Equity Group Fund One. When uh, the end of the year comes, I give you a K-1. You go to your accountant and they break all that down into individual K-1s for all your investors. And I give you a check. You put it in the bank and then you write individual checks for all your investors. That works. You're the issuer of your own securities. And we actually do quite a few, probably four or five a year of something I would call a fund of funds, where someone comes to us and they syndicate money to invest in other people's funds. Example, there are a couple big funds out there that have a million dollar minimum for an individual investment investor. And everyone has to be accredited. Well, not everyone has a million dollars, but if you put together a fund and let's say you raise $5 million, uh, $200,000 at a time from accredited investors, you could take a share of this million dollar big fund and you could take a share of this other million dollar big fund and the people who invest with you who could never get into those funds take advantage of pooling their resources and then diversifying into those, into those big funds. And we call that a fund to funds and it's totally, totally legal and totally done. All right. And in that point, you're, you're following the rules and you're, you're structured properly and, and you basically have capital. I mean, if you're raising the capital then you can deploy it and participate sure. in these, these uh, other investment opportunities is, are, are you, um, would you essentially be coming in uh, if, if the, the Darren Gross Fund was participating with uh, the Gene Trowbridge Fund? Would that be would 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 I be a, or my fund be a limited partner in yours, or would, yes. would it come in as a general right. or as, as you'd a, come in as a, a limited? limited you'd come in as a member. Okay. Yeah, I don't want you in my managing member 
uh, entity because that puts risk on you. Right. You, we don't want the risk. We just want to, uh, uh, you just want our, we just want your money, right. but we don't you want you to share in management and share in our risk. Right. Right. No, I, it, it's, again, I appreciate you kind of distinguishing that because it's, it's always seemed a little bit, uh, fast and loose when I've gotten into a few of these conversations. Well, the things I see that are wrong in the marketplace today is uh, people saying you can do joint ventures and it's not a security. I think they're loose with those facts. So you have to look at that. Um, people saying you can raise money for me and I'll pay for you, pay you for that. I think that is that is fast and loose. And another one we haven't talked about, which is maybe too deep, is something called a side letter, where you take 20 investors in under a certain set of rules. And I take Darren in and I say, no matter what I'm doing for the other investors, uh, I'm going to pay you twice as much of a yield. Okay. Well, that's okay, but I better tell all the other investors. Right. You know, because, right. you know, all the material facts has to be disclosed or sometimes uh, Darren's going to come in with uh, a big amount of money and Darren is going to want more access to the books and the records and the decision making than the other members. So we better tell the other members that because maybe what's in the best interest of Darren isn't in the best interest of the other members. And maybe we should all be alerted to that something that could happen. Yeah, full disclosure. Yeah, that's Later. right. Um, hey, we, we've been talking a lot about kind of the, the come together uh, of a syndication and, and essentially to buy a property or invest in property. And, and uh, you know, once it's acquired, it's operated. And, and uh, assumably the, the property is profitable and, and there's distributions and and those all follow per the, the operating agreement as to how everybody's going to be paid. Um, can you talk a little bit about the liquidation and how a, a syndication treats it and if there's any kind of an opportunity to um, take advantage of like a 1031 exchange or, sure. or you know, what the options are there? So we've owned this property and we've gone full cycle and now it's time to do something, okay? There's, there's going to be a capital event happening. And one of the capital events could be a refinance. So what we do is we put a new loan on the property, generate new cash, and give it back to the investors. That's a return of their capital. Uh, the property's gone up in value. They have equity. We refinance it, give them their money back, and uh, continue to own that property. Sometimes we take the money that we earn from the uh, uh, refinance and go out and buy another property. Now we own two properties. So there's a lot of uh, situations that are possible in a refinance. The other thing, of course, is just a sale. We sell the property, uh, we pay off all the debt, and there's all that money sitting there in the bank we're giving people their equity back. So it's a return of capital. We pay them all off and they go away. The smart syndicator has another offering ready at that time. Darren, we're gonna sell this property. Your 100,000 is now 300,000. And by the time we get the sale of that ready, I'm gonna have a new offering and I'd like to have you consider investing some of your money in that. That's what the smart, invest, smart syndicator does. And then the exchange, okay. <clears throat> the LLC that owns the property, Darren, has a deed to that property. The exchange rules simply say, you can exchange your deed and the equity represented by your deed for another deed on another property moving your equity without it being diluted by uh, income taxes, reporting gain, okay? So we have this property, uh, we took our $500,000 investment, it's worth, uh, we now have a million and a half, we can take that million and a half and go over and buy a $5 million property. The LLC that sells 
is the LLC that buys. Nothing changes, the money just transfers. Simple. Just like you doing an exchange on your own property. You own it in your, your name, you sell it, the money goes to the accommodator, you buy another property in your name, it's a 1031 exchange. Same thing, LLC buys another property. The issue becomes when someone wants out. I was gonna ask. So. <laughs> See, that's, that's smooth, but the problem is the first deal was 10 years ago and now I'm 72. I don't wanna get in another 10 year deal. I want my money, okay? Right. So how, it's very simple what you do. You survey your investors and you know what your investors want to do. How many are going to go with you in the same LLC? How many are going to want their money? So what you do is in the escrow instructions, uh, at the time of the sale, you set up two escrows. One escrow is for the money that needs to go to Gene Trowbridge because Gene is going to leave. And the other escrow is for the money that's going to stay with the LLC that's going to buy the new property. So when the closing happens, the cash goes into the correct escrow. I get my money, taxable, okay? All these other people accomplish a tax deferral in their 1031 exchange because they never got anything. They just transferred their equity from one property to another property and that's not taxable. And is there any number of, of uh, partners or members that need to go to the second deal to retain that? <clears throat> that? No, the number isn't the issue. There are a couple issues that can happen. Number one, uh, some of the states have rules that if the membership of an LLC changes by more than 50%, the LLC is dissolved. That's a problem because you got to take title in the same LLC. So you have to worry about that. Number two, the rules in a 1031 exchange is that what you have to acquire is a property at least of equal value with a loan at least the same as the loan you gave up. Well, if too many people leave and take their money, maybe you're not gonna be able to do that, right? So that's just an issue of balancing equity and balancing loans. Now, what if too many people leave and you can't buy all of this new property with who's left? You can buy part of it. You and it can change into a tenant in common interest in this new property and raise money from new investors who will buy the other tenant in common interest. So we can still solve the exchange for the equity we're bringing over here. And then we can give new people, some of whom may also have exchange money, can come in as a tenant in common. So all this gets involved with the, um, the exchange accommodator and with the CPA for the uh, LLC and any new investors, uh, their tax advisor and their accommodator. But we see that quite a bit. Where we are today in the marketplace is anyone who bought a property uh, 2012, 13, 14, who still owns it has a lot of equity. And they're all interested in how do we, how do we move the equity without paying tax? How do we keep it? That's the or right. or keep it. You know, you yeah. want because no one. The problem is, if you pay taxes, your equity goes down. You buy another property, and and with the tax laws today, if you just keep your property until you die, given the right uh, size of your estate, uh, you never do pay taxes on it. So, right, right. Now I appreciate you you uh, walking through that because I think that's always been kind of the. Um, <clears throat> I'd say some of the, the newer real estate investors that I've uh, talked with that, that are kind of in and out of something really fast or, and have maybe been used to kind of a stock market, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in and out, the, the tax thing never doesn't even phase them. Uh, but if you've been in, in a property for any length of time and you've experienced some 
significant uh, appreciation and, and, you know, maybe you've depreciated the property down Absolutely. significantly. You've got a whole different uh, kettle of fish there. That, that Another uh, question that comes up, Darren, in that same issue, and I get this call periodically, one of my clients will call me and will say, hey, I'm raising money. I found someone who's got $500,000 sitting in an accommodator's account. Can they invest in my syndication? And the answer is no, because what the syndication is, what you're buying in an LLC is personal property. You don't get title to real estate. You buy shares or interests in an LLC. Someone coming out of a property and wanting to accomplish a 1031 exchange needs to get title to real estate. Gotcha, and that's why the TIC works. That's um, right. Because you're on, on title then. Got it. Um, Boy, we're covering a lot of stuff. You no, know? It, well, you're, you're just a wealth <laughs> of information, and it's just nice to be able to speak with somebody that has, you know, the the clarity and and understanding and the knowledge of all this. I, I, I've got to ask you a question, and this was something I thought of just based on a, a uh, an insurance related uh, uh, topic. Um, protection. Uh, what, what kind of protection does the syndication provide? Uh, the, the general partner uh, or the limited partner? Is it based on the, the, the contract or is there, can you speak to that? It's based on state law. Okay. If you form and, and you use the words limited partner and general partner, which means you're using a limited partnership. Okay. If you form a limited partnership, the limited partners have absolute protection their only liability is what they have invested or any promises they make to invest more money. Uh, I've invested $100,000, that's it, that's all I'm liable for, or I've invested 100 now and I've signed a note to invest 100 two years from now when we do construction, well, I'm liable for that note, okay? But that's all I'm liable for. Uh, the general partner is liable for everything has unlimited liability. That's why 99% of everything is done in an LLC. Because in an LLC, the uh, members have the same limited liability they have in a limited partnership, but they can also vote, which they cannot do as a limited partner. They can't have any share in the management or they're deemed to be general partners, and then they lose their limited liability. So the limited, the members in a limited uh, liability company have total protection based on the state law, and uh, the manager has total protection. Way back in the 80s when limited liability companies weren't in existence, the state of Wyoming was having some trouble because their, their um, drilling and oil and gas and all that industry, uh, you know, we had quite a, a meltdown in the economy in 1981. And um, their industry died. And what the problem was is the, the wildcatters, <laughs> the guys who had gone out to raise the money and do all this as limit general partners finally learned what unlimited liability meant. And they just got crucified. And the investors who were limited partners who couldn't vote, couldn't really do anything to help save their money. So Wyoming actually was the first state to develop a limited liability company, which solved two things. It gave the Wildcatters a new name, managing member, and gave them limited liability. And it gave the investor a new name, members, and gave them, while keeping the right to limited liability, gave them the right to vote. So it solved two of the problems. The manager was willing to go out and take the risk because now they were shielded with limited liability and the investors were ready to come back in the marketplace because if anything went wrong, they could vote and they thought at least that they could correct things. So there we are in 1981 and all of a sudden, all the other states uh, created their own individual limited liability company. So to answer your question, each state has their own rule, but generally 
the manager is protected and the members are protected. Doesn't help the manager if the manager goes off and signs a recourse mortgage. Right. Okay. <laughs> no, that's, that's you. <clears throat> <laughs> you uh, you sign that. No, I appreciate you you uh, explaining that. You know, it's funny uh, uh, how much of law or you know policy is reactive to events, and uh, get a little bit of a, a history there on, on oh, how absolutely. the policies came about there. So that's great. Hey, Gene, uh, before uh, we started recording, I mentioned to you that by day I'm an insurance broker. And uh, as such, uh, in insurance, we we try and manage risk with our clients. And uh, there's a couple different strategies that we typically uh, consider. And the, the first is we ask, can we avoid the risk? Uh, if we can't avoid it, then we look to see if there's a way we can minimize the risk. And then if there's not a way to avoid or minimize, we look to see if there's a way to transfer the risk. And that's essentially what an insurance policy is. And um, I've been asking all of my guests, and I'd like to uh, see what, if, if you would uh, take up the cause, but if they could consider or take a look and consider what they see to be the biggest risk. And uh, just for clarification, I'm not necessarily looking for an insurance related answer. I, risk is certainly more broad than that. Um, but if you're game, I'd like to ask you, Gene Trowbridge, what is the biggest <laughs> risk? Okay, well, you talked about avoiding, minimizing, and transferring, okay? So, avoiding the risk. In my best legal language, don't do this. That's how you avoid the risk of being a syndicator. Just don't do it. And what is the biggest risk? The biggest risk is really the investors. Never the property. Properties will, will get empty and go into foreclosure and all that. You can always deal with that. <clears throat> Excuse me, but you can't deal with the investor whose life changes in the middle of a project. That's really the biggest risk. So simply how to avoid the risk is to don't do it. Well, if you're going to do it, then the question is how do you minimize it? Okay. You might minimize it by the investors you choose. You could have a strategy of only dealing with accredited investors who are rich and smart, who have enough money uh, where they can handle the risk of your investment. That might be a good one. Uh, another way to minimize it is make sure your manager LLC is formed correctly so that people can't get at you if there's trouble. And maybe to, uh, uh, this is kind of an asset protection answer. Maybe you want to be an LLC yourself, and then that LLC becomes the member of your manager LLC. So they really have to go through multiple loops. Every once in a while, I think asset protection gets a little carried away. You can have two very too many of these LLCs and tax returns and all that stuff, but that's not uncommon for the manager to be an LLC and have the members of the manager be LLCs. The one thing you don't want to be is an individual manager. You got 30 investors up there and Gene Trowbridge is the individual manager. There's no protection for Gene Trowbridge from those 30 investors. I'm in the LLC with all the other investors are kind of protected from the outside world, but any investor can go after me for everything I have. So we want the manager to be, have the layer of protection, the LLC. Uh, when I did it, it was a sub S corporation, same protection, but different issues that I was trying to deal with uh, insurance and employees and all that stuff. But today almost everyone is a, um, is a uh, an LLC. And then the last one, how do you transfer the risk? Well, I don't know if you do. I don't know if you do. I, th I think one thing I would say is the manager LLC is constructed in such a way that it has no assets. 
all you want, you don't want your, let's say there's a commercial real estate broker listening to us and he has an office with 20 salespeople and owns some buildings. That's not going to be the managing member. We're going to form a brand new entity that's clean. And the only thing the managing member actually ever gets is some cash distribution for the fees and some subordinated interest that might occur in the future. Okay. So there's nothing in there. Okay. So um, <clears throat> don't syndicate. <laughs> Minimize your risk by having limited liability uh, protection around you, at least one or two layers, and then make sure that nothing in your syndication world really at any time has any value. Now I do get I do get asked this question: Should we buy director's insurance? I was going to okay. ask you if that yeah that's, that's, that ever that's come a, up. I thought you should ask yeah, me that. Yeah. Um, our clients ask us that, and we've researched a lot of it, and it's very expensive. Simple answer: very expensive, and doesn't cover the crap that you do, the fraud that you do the stealing money that you do, all the stuff that managers get in trouble for. It doesn't cover that anyhow, so don't waste your money. Yeah, the exclusions. <laughs> Lloyd's uh, of London. Yeah, yeah, that's where we've had some people who have big, big funds, and they'll buy it, and very, very expensive. And I don't know really what it protects. Yeah, no, I, I um, <laughs> talked to a couple of underwriters about this, and... Um, you know, I, I think that the, I think where the exposure I would think that exists or where it may be more applicable would be in a, a very large fund mm -hmm. with, um, you know, large money and, and the potential for a suit to come from one of your investors uh, mm -hmm. for a quote mismanagement or something mm -hmm. like that. But, but just like you said, if you're, if you're taking the money or you're, if you're stealing, you know, crime is not a covered uh, peril right. there, but, but the, kind of the defense uh, of any kind of a mismanagement uh, kind of thing is more of the, I think the nature of the coverage. I'll tell you another thing that, that, that I just thought of, the operating agreement of the company can also be a protection for the manager. In our operating agreement, we have a pretty well worked out dispute resolution provision which is designed, I'm not going to go into all the details, it's designed to keep you out of court. It takes you through mediation, it takes you through arbitration, and then it has some pretty strict rules like number one, no attorney's fee provision for the person who's bringing the lawsuit. That usually stops a lot of stuff. And number two, uh, the only remedy is your original investment. No damages. Now, I don't know if all that's legal, but that's what we put in there. It's never been challenged. And the, the deals that we've had where there have been disputes have always been resolved before we go to court. Right. Well, it's certainly a better starting point than uh, nothing <laughs> written and, and no guidelines. And uh, you get right. to test it all in court and, and uh, pay all the uh, sure. attorney fees and, and uh, the time. Um, well, Gene, this, is, this has been uh, exactly everything I'd hoped it would be and more. And uh, before we wrap up, where can the listeners go if they would like to uh, connect or learn more? All right. Well, our website is crowdfundinglawyers.net. And it's a great website. We have all sorts of things on it. We have a YouTube channel. We have all sorts of stuff. Um, you can reach me at gene at crowdfundinglawyers.net. That's probably the best way to work with me. I typically use my emails like a telephone. If you send me an email and it's an important question, I'll just call you. So if you're going to send me an email and you want me to call you, be sure you put your phone number in there. Okay? <laughs> and then I can call you. Other than that, I have to send you an email and say, hey, I want to talk to you about this, but I can't because <laughs> I don't have your phone number. So the best thing to do would be gene at crowdfundinglawyers.net or just go to our website. And if you want a, um, if you want a consultation with me, you can sign up at the website for a 15 minute or a half hour consultation with me. And that works also, Darren. Awesome. Well, Gene, again, I cannot say thanks enough for taking the time. Uh, enjoyed it immensely. Uh, learned a lot and uh, hope we can do it again soon. 
Hey, thanks, Darren. Appreciate it. All right. For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio.